ಶ್ರೀಗುರವೆ ನಮ ನಮ ವಿಷ್ಣುಪೃಷ್ಟೂತಲೆ ಶ್ರೀಮತಿ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ನಮನೆ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ದೇವಿ ಘೋರವಾಣಿ ಪ್ರಚಾರಿಣೆ ನಿರ್ವಿಶೇಷ ಶೂನ್ಯವಾರಿ ಪಶ್ಚಾಚಾರಿಣೆ ಪಂಚಕೌಪತರುಭ್ಯಶ್ಚ ಕೃಪಾ ಸಿಂಧುಭಯ ಪತಿ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾಧಾರ ಶ್ರೀ ವಾಸತಿ ಗೋರ್ಭಕ್ತವೃಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೇ ಹರೇ ಸೊ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ಟು ಅರ್ ಆನ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಾಗವತ ಟೆಂತ್ ಕ್ಯಾಂಟೋ and we're today we're going to go on to chapter number 7 and chapter number 7 is entitled the killing of the demon trinavarta recording in progress i think before we go on let's just have a review of what we've covered i began the class with the first lesson we spoke about the birth of lord krishna right that was chapter number 3 anybody remember anything about the birth of lord krishna can tell me something yes prabhu maharaj the uh, constellations and stars were indicating auspicious positions and you also mentioned this could be a uh, challenge to anyone who claims to be god you yeah. can we can see, see the astrological calculation and test verify if that person is it really an incarnation okay very good thank you prabhu yeah right okay we spoke about the birth of krishna and the auspicious conditions on the planet then we went on to chapter number 4 and we heard about the atrocities of king kamsa maybe someone else could tell me something from chapter 4 about the atrocities of king kamsa maharaj yes prabhu ಮೀಟಿಂಗ್ ರೈಟ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ವೆಲ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ we had uh, after the birth of lord krishna kamsa had gone to the prison where vasudev and devaki was in because he heard that the eighth child was born so kamsa went to the prison and he was very eager to kill the eighth child do you remember what happened um well, he went to kill the eighth ch- child but then there was a daughter then comes out took took her by the legs and tried to smash her against a rock but then she slipped out of his hands and climbed to the sky and appeared as the surga devi and told him that the the eighth son well the, the boy who is supposed to kill you has already been born somewhere else right yes yes and then it was the next day then comes had the meeting with his lieutenants or his ministers and they encouraged they between vasudev and uh vasudev and maharaj nanda right and that took place where where did they meet in mathura in mathura yes right they met in mathura Nanda Maharaj had gone there to pay taxes. And when they met Nanda Maharaj, of course before that they celebrated the birth of Lord Krishna, and after Nanda Maharaj had celebrated the birth of Lord Krishna, then he thought he should go to Mathura and pay his taxes, 
and after paying his taxes, he met with Vasudev, and Vasudev warned Nanda Maharaj that you should get home as quick as possible, because there may be some inauspiciousness, some inauspicious events may take place there, so it's good if you're there to take care of any problems. So Nanda Maharaj had great faith in the words of Vasudev, and he rushed back to Goku. And when he got back to Goku, that's when he got a big shock, right? What was the shock? Saw Putana dead already. Yes, he saw this huge body, miles long, on the ground, like a mountain. So he wondered what had been going on. And so he he heard from the people how this Putana had come in and done her nefarious activities there, trying to kill baby Krishna with her poison breast. So that was the class yesterday. We heard about Putana and how she was delivered. And what position did she get? What happened to her after Krishna took out her life air? Nurse. Yes, she became a nurse. Where? In the spiritual world. Which place? Golok In Golok, right. In Golok, right. She went, she got to Golok. So that was showing us the power of bhakti. What bhakti did she do? She dressed like a gopi and she's offering her milk to Lord Krishna. Yes. And what about her at the time of her death? At the time of her death, she's suffering a lot, very painful. Why? Because Krishna is sucking her life air out of her breast and also Krishna touched her body with his feet. Yeah, he kicked her. <laughs> he's kicking her with his feet. <laughs> she's trying to get him off. He's kicking her and he's holding her breast. <laughs> so she's blessed. She got the, the dust of Lord Krishna's lotus feet at the time of her death. So she got a very wonderful destination by the grace of Krishna. So we're going to go on today to chapter number seven, and chapter number seven is the killing of the demon Trinavarta. So the chapter begins with Maharaj Parikshit expressing his desire. He wants to hear more, that he's really, well, he thinks this is really wonderful when he heard about how Krishna killed the demon Agasura, who, who was really happy. And he thought, these pastimes of Lord Krishna are so wonderful. And he thought, I want to hear more about Krishna's childhood lila, because these pastimes are so relishable. Of course, you've already studied the Damodar lila, right? You already went ahead to do those chapters. I think last week you did Damodar lila, isn't it? Yes? yes uh -huh. So that was also Krishna's childhood pastimes, and I'm sure you relish that. So some time to get to the tenth canto, and so Maharaj Pariksit knows his time is very here. The, the pastimes of Lord Krishna he thinks it will be very nice to hear more about the pastimes of Krishna. Uh, Prabhupada makes some points in the purport. He, he talk, Prabhupada in the purport, he talks about our problems. He's writing for our benefit. He said, first of all, however, we have no attraction for hearing about Krishna. And this is the root cause of our suffering. And Lord Chaitanya also talks about this in the Shikshastikam. Do you remember Lord Chaitanya said, we are so unfortunate, we have no attraction. The second... Durdevam, 
Yes. Yes. Durdaiva midrishami hajanin. Durdaiva. Right. We're very unfortunate. We have no attraction for the holy name. Although Krishna has given us so many wonderful names to chant, we have no attraction. And Krishna has also performed so many wonderful pastimes. But still, there are so many people they don't want to hear. So this is the problem. Ma However, Maharaj Parikshit specifically mentions the wonderful activities of baby Krishna, which amazed Mother Yashoda and the other inhabitants of Braja. And uh, these are especially attractive. So, therefore, Maharaj Parikshit recommends one hear about Krishna. Krishna's childhood activities, more because they are more attractive than the activities of other incarnations, such as Machya, Kurma and Varaha. Wanting to hear more and more from Sukadeva Goswami, Maharaj Parikshit requested him to continue describing Krishna's childhood activities, which are especially easy to hear and which create more and more inquisitiveness. So inquisitiveness, this is a very good quality. We should be of jignasu, right? Four kinds of people come to Krishna consciousness. One is the inquis out of inqui being curious, inquisitive. And so it's a good thing. We should be more curious, more inquisitive about the pastimes of Krishna. Oh, Krishna did that? Oh, who was this? And how did that happen? It's very interesting for us to hear, we become more inquisitive and that may, that's enlivening for everyone. We try to encourage that inquisitive, understand more. And Prabhupada, when he, Prabhupada met that one kid, uh, Prabhupada was in Mayapur and this one, one young American man came and he met with Srila Prabhupada. And every day the young man had so many questions and Prabhupada said that, that this, this could make a book and they printed the book, Perfect Questions, Perfect Answers. And here we see, all of, actually all of our Shastras are based on questions and answers. Bhagavad Gita, you've got Arjuna putting questions to Krishna and here in the Srimad Bhagavatam you've been hearing a lot of questions. We had the sages in Naimisharanya with Sonakarishi, and we had uh, also, of course, Maharaj Parikshit put questions to Sukadeva Goswami, and Vidura put questions to Uddhava, and then to Maitreya. So a lot of questions. And you've got also Maharaj Yudhisthira questioning Narada Muni, and, and Narada Muni questioning Brahma, all these things. It's, the whole Bhagavatam is full of questions and answers. So it's, imp it's also good for us to uh, hear about Krishna's pastimes and continue that inquisitiveness. We want to enrich our own understanding by discussing. This is the business of devotees. To shanti chara manti shah. The thoughts of my devotees dwell in me, their lives are surrendered unto me. And they derive great satisfaction and bliss by enlightening one another and conversing about me. So meeting together every day is very nice to have this opportunity to discuss topics of Krishna. And the wonderful thing about Lord Krishna is because he's appearing on this planet earth and he's imitating a human child. But at the same time, he's performing these wonderful activities. So this is brought up in text number three, that these pastimes are very wonderful because he's coming onto this planet. And Prabhupada actually writes there, in, in the purport there, he says, uh, but on other planets, the inhabitants are more advanced. And therefore, the pastimes the Lord performs there are still more wonderful. Krishna's appearance about him. So what makes us more fortunate than the demigods in the higher planets? Krishna's 
Krishna personally took birth here in the earthly planet. Yes. So that means, but Krishna also takes, does Krishna take birth in the higher planets? No, he does. He does? Yes. No. Huh? No, no, no. Yes, Maharaj, he does. Like uh, Vaman Dev appeared in the Swarga. Yes, Lord Vamana Dev appears up in heavenly planets. But that's not Krishna. What about Lord Krishna? When Lord Vamana Dev appears, does he appear in the form of a demigod? No. No, he's a it's a dwarf brahmana. What a, so there's definitely some special uniqueness about the, the, the appearance of Lord Krishna on this planet because he appears in the human form, a form similar to ours. Even the people on Vaikuntha, they don't have that opportunity. It, it's different there. We see Lord Krishna coming in our in, in the human form. Of course, we are made in the form of Krishna. Krishna's original form is two armed. Sometimes people think God we make God in our form, but actually Krishna He's made us in his form. We have taken the form like Krishna. It's not that Krishna took a form like us, but we have taken a form like Krishna. Because we come on this planet, we're all thinking, I want to be God anyway. <laughs> so Krishna gives us the body, but he doesn't give us the, the spiritual body. But Lord Krishna comes to show us his wonderful pastimes, and that makes us very fortunate, more fortunate than the people in the higher planets. Okay, going ahead, text number four, and we hear about... Mother Yashoda, she's going to do a Vedic ceremony for her child, right? It's called Uttana. Do you do this in your Hindu society? Srinivas Prabhu, have you heard? On the last day of the Chaturmasya, like today, at the end of Chaturmasya, the last day, then they, they have this Uttana, the raising of the deity. Because they say, like Krishna takes rest during the four months, or Lord Vishnu takes rest during the four months of Chaturmasya. So at the end of the Chaturmasya, they do this Uttana ceremony, where the, de the deity rises. But in this particular case here, they talk, Prabhupada talks about, about after three months, when the child starts to turn by himself, that the child can actually turn onto his side by himself. So that's when they do this Uttana ceremony. And it's only the married ladies who do it. You're a brahmachari, so you wouldn't know anything about this, you know. This, it, it's mentioned here, it was only the gopis, the married ladies, those who could have, la have children or who already had children, they would all come and they would do a ceremony at this particular time. Maharaj, in our uh, culture we do, we take the child to the temple and then later on we take them to the other houses or... Yes, that's right. It said, it said on the fourth month, at the end of the three months, at the beginning, that's when the child can come out of the house. Right? Did you stay, did yes, you stay at home for yes, three Maharaj, months? That is when they take them to the temple and do some ritual. How long do you wait before you go to the temple? I'm not very sure, Maharaj. I don't know much details on that. Yeah, some... we, wait, we wait for three months, uh, Maharaj. Really? You wait for three months? Yeah, after three months we take the child. It's mentioned, the it's mentioned here like that, three months, yeah, or three, three four months. Yeah, some, some time... And then also when the child turns over, then uh, we have a festival. And then when the child starts crawling, we have a festival. And then when the child crosses over out of the house, no crosses, uh, uh, then also we have a festival for no, the child. Oh, wonderful. You do all these things. So you did all these things for your children. Yeah. Very nice. And so, very fortunate. Rohini was in the same constellation as the moon. So it was very auspicious. And she got the Brahmins to come to chant Vedic mantras. And musicians also. So it was a big ceremony by Mother, uh, arranged by Mother Yashoda for the ladies.
And Prabhupada in the purport, he talks about different ceremonies which we should do for the children. He says, he said, just like when the woman's pregnant, then after three months pregnancy, there's a ceremony, and then after seven months, then another ceremony. And he, he talks about how to do it even. He said there's a ceremony, the mother observes by eating with neighborhood children. <laughs> you get the neighboring children to come and the mother eats with them, feeds the children. This ceremony is called Swada Bhakshana. And then other different samskaras are there for the child. So these samskaras, they're all for the purification for the child and to create auspiciousness and prosperity. So very nice, we want, we want to encourage these things. We see from our Krishna consciousness movement, people become more aware of these things now. Things like, you know, anaprasna, of course that's after the child is born, but still, Gradually, more and more, you know, get them started and we learn about the different ceremonies, it's very nice. But you need brahmanas to also do these things, you have to have some brahmanas. This. So text 5 describes more about this Uttana ceremony. Mother Yashoda is going to do the bathing of the baby. And the brahmanas, they get also charity. You know, the, the, the type of charity they got then, different from what we could do nowadays. But, you know, in, in the times of Mother Yashoda, they give the brahmanas cows and food grains and eatables, clothing. So this ceremony was performed very gorgeously satisfied everyone and all the ladies were very happy to see the child healthy. So Mother Yashoda, she was busy taking care of all the guests and she's giving people different charity and you know because it was her child so everybody's some kind of friend of hers. So she has to speak to everyone and she has to take care of the brahmanas and do different, give different charities to different people. So what happened? She put baby Krishna down. Baby Krish Krishna had like taken rest. After she bathed him, then they, they, they put, dressed him and laid him down to take rest. So she put him in a cot and she placed that cot under a under, uh, uh, what's it called, the cart, under the, and, and that cart was a cart or bullet cart or something. So this was a big cart and it's mentioned actually, it said it was as, as big as a tala tree. I don't know tala trees, but, but from the way it's used, I understand it to be quite tall. So she put baby Krishna in, her, in his cart and she placed him under this cart, which was really big. And the cart was full with many different uh, containers, different vessels. The commentaries say that the cart was carrying different things, dairy products. That means there was ghee and cheese and yogurt and milk. It was, it was all there on the cart, these different liquids. And Krishna, baby Krishna was placed underneath that cart while Mother Yashoda went away to t talk to all the guests. So it was at that time when Krishna was laying down there under the cart, it said, we're told that Krishna desired to drink his mother's milk. And when the child doesn't get what they want, you know, a little child, what will they do? They'll cry and they'll kick their arms and legs, wave their arms and legs. So baby Krishna was crying, but Mother Yashoda couldn't hear him because there were so many people around, because of the festival was going on. Musicians were playing and the brahmanas were chanting and all the guests were there. 
So Mother Yashoda was really busy. She couldn't hear baby Krishna crying. So Krishna kicked his legs. And when he kicked his legs, then he kicked that cart. And that cart actually, on that cart, there was a particular demon called Shakatasura. Shakatasura, another agent of Kamsa, who had come there with the intention of trying to harm or give, give some trouble to baby Krishna. So there's an interesting story about Shakatasura. We were talking yesterday, some, one of the devotees was expressing that, uh, that it seems the, the mother Puta, that Putana got liberation very easily. Although she didn't really have so much devotion that she got liberation very easily. So then it was brought up that we have to understand who she was in her previous life and what she must have done to get that position of Putana and to take part in Lord Krishna's pastimes and to be killed by Lord Krishna. So similarly, the Shakatasura, he was a special demon, right? Does anybody know who was this Shakatasura? Son of the Mother Earth, right? Sorry? Was the son of the of Bhumi. The son of Bhumi? Really? Maybe not. No, maybe not. I, I, I think I... Utkatcha. And he was known, his name was Utkatcha. So he was, his name was Utkatcha. So what happened was, uh, he got cursed by Loma Sharishi that he did not, he did not give, oh, no, what happened was he, he knocked down a lot of trees and he broke a lot of trees. So Lomasha was angry at him for breaking these trees. So he cursed, he cursed this Utkacha that he should, that he should not have a body, that he would not have any, any body. So then this person, he fell at the feet of Lomasha and he begged him that please, please, that don't curse me like this. So he said, all right, you will have a body of air. And he said, you will stay in this body until the next Manvantara. And at that time you'll be liberated by the feet of Lord Krishna, by the feet of the Supreme Lord. He will come and liberate you by the touch of his feet. So that, that was how it was described in the, the commentaries which I've been reading. So we, we see, you know, <laughs> he's a demon, he's got the demon body, but previously he wasn't a demon, but he made some offense and somehow didn't get the mercy. This Lomasha cursed him. And when they curse, okay, they get, there's some curse, but some good thing comes of it. Of course, he, was a, he said he was the son of Haranyaksha. Haranyaksha was a demon, so he was born in the, that family. But still, Prahlad was also born in a similar family, son of Haranyakashipu. So, contact with the great sage, that's the, the blessing. So this Shakatatsura, he had contacted in his previous life, he had contacted Lomasha, and Lomasha had cursed him. So Shakatatsura, he, he doesn't actually become a cart. It's not that the demon became a cart, but rather he took the opportunity of the cart. He, he, he covered the cart. It's mentioned here in the first, first sentence that Krishna had been placed underneath a household handcart. But this handcart was actually another form of the Shakatasura, a demon who had come there to kill the child. So 
it's mentioned that Sakatasura actually doesn't actually become the cart, but he covers the cart. It has form like, you know, just like you can put a layer over, over the cart. So like that, his body was covering the cart. And when Krishna kicked the cart, he was actually kicking this Shakatasura. And the commentary goes on to describe the Shakatasura when he was touched by the feet of Lord Krishna, then he was of Lord Krishna. So he was able to go back to Godhead. So this is the pastimes of Lord Krishna. Krishna wanted to draw the attention of his mother. But by doing so, he created a great havoc, not understandable by ordinary persons. So Krishna created a big scene by knocking the car apart, although he's just a little baby, and his feet are very soft. Just a little baby, small child, feet are very soft, and he touches the car, and just by the touch of his feet, the car all falls apart, although it's carrying so many heavy things. But Krishna is unharmed. Miraculously, there was no harm done to anyone. Just all the things which were on the cart, they were all knocked everywhere. So everything was knocked around. So Prabhupada comments there at the end of the purport of number six. These narrations are actually so enjoyable and enlightening that Maharaj Parikshit and Sukadeva Goswami took pleasure in them and other liberated persons following in their footsteps become fully jubilant by hearing about the wonderful activities of the Lord. So this is what we all want to do. We want to continuously hear, we want to absorb ourselves in hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam, very important for us, very powerful message. Any comments from anyone so far? We'll go ahead. Text number seven. Lord Krishna was laying down in the courtyard. The wheels had all broken apart. The utensils were all scattered hither and thither. Everybody, Mother Yashoda and the other ladies, Nanda Maharaj, the other men, they were wondering what happened? What happened? How could it do like this? And they were, and there were some boys, young boys there. So the young boys, they had actually seen Krishna use his feet and flay his feet and kick the cart with his feet. So they said, Krishna did it. That baby Krishna, he, he did it with his feet. But Mother Yashoda, Nanda Maharaj, the gopis, they said, oh no, come on. That's ridiculous. How could the little baby do this? They didn't want to believe it. They wouldn't accept that baby Krishna had actually done this. So this is a wonderful pastime which took place, the killing of Shakatasura, how he was liberated by the touch of Lord Krishna's lotus feet. Anyway, it was a mystery that you know, so many things, so many objects on the cart had all been knocked over. So it was like another, another, another calamity had happened. And Lord Krishna is involved, this child Krishna is involved. Text number eight, number nine describes how the, their they're, spe they're thinking, how could, how could this happen? Who did it? Is it the work of some demon or evil planet? And that's when they ask the small children. As soon as the crying baby got, had kicked the car, the car had collapsed. There was no doubt about it. But... <laughs> Nanda Maharaj, they cannot believe this. They won't accept this. The little boys are saying, they're saying, these little boys, that they, they're, they're, they don't know. It couldn't be like that. So we have to understand these things properly. 
we have to understand the nature of Lord Krishna's pastimes, how Lord Krishna, even though he's a little baby, still he has these transcendental, inconceivable powers and can do anything which is beyond the powers of our own mind and senses. Prabhupada comments at the end of the purport of text number 9, unless one is on the spiritual platform, one cannot enjoy the transcendental activities of Krishna. Or, in other words, whoever engages in hearing the transcendental activities of Krishna is not on the material platform, but on the transcendental spiritual platform. So Srila Prabhupada used to take so much pleasure in hearing the Krishna book. When he was in Los Angeles, he would sit in his garden there and he would have his servant come and read to him. And Prabhupada would enjoy hearing the pastimes of Lord Krishna. And when Prabhupada would hear the narrations, Prabhupada would say to, he would remark, he said, I have not written this book. I have not written this book. It's all been written by Krishna through me. Krishna used me to write this book. It's certainly the most wonderful book in narrating all the pastimes of Lord Krishna. So the gopis and Nanda Maharaj, they, they, they remember, they have so much prema. They, they're not like Devaki and Vasudev who have this Aishwarya Gyan. Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda, the gopas and the gopis, they're all prema bhaktas. They have this pure bhakti and they cannot believe that Krishna has inconceivable powers. They think, oh, it's a little baby, how could he have these powers? He's just a little child, he's just only three, four months old. So they didn't want to accept what these young boys were saying. So Mother Yashoda, she, what does she do when she sees her child? She just simply picks him up and feeds her breast milk to him. Because she has so much love for her child, so her breasts are always flowing with milk. It said her clothes were always wet because her milk was always flowing from her body due to her love for her child. And then she calls for the brahmanas. Just like when the incident happened with Putana, they got the brahmana, they did so many, well the ladies themselves did the rituals. They, they got the, cow, the tail of the cow and they chanted so many mantras and they bathed the child. Remember, we heard yesterday they bathed the child in cow urine and then they got the dust rays from the hooves of the cows. So here, this, on this occasion, Mother Yashoda calls the Brahmanas because they're already there. Remember, they were doing the Uttana ceremony. So the brahmanas had, were already there. So Mother Yashoda asked the brahmanas to chant Vedic hymns and do some ritualistic ceremonies just to create auspiciousness. And then they have to pick everything up. Oh, it's mentioned then they did also a fire sacrifice to, to appease the, black, the bad planet. And then with rice, grains, kusha, water and curd, they worshipped the Supreme Lord. Of course, they don't know that their child is the Supreme Lord. They are thinking the Supreme Lord is the deity or Lord Vishnu. They cannot understand that Lord Krishna himself, their child, is actually the Supreme Lord. This is because of their bhava, because they have this very intense, deep bhava for Lord Krishna. Okay, going ahead. Text 13 to 15 talks about the qualities of the brahmanas. Who is actually a qualified brahmana? Now, this is important for us. The important point is because we're, we're all devotees in the Krishna consciousness movement. And people will often ask us for blessings, right? I'm sure you've all been asked at some time, the people will say to you, well, give me your blessings. Even sometimes other devotees will say, give me your blessing, bless me. 
So we are often asked for blessings. So what kind of blessings should we give? Yes, Prabhu? Yes, right. That's the right answer. That's how it's described in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. <clears throat> that we, we should bless people. May your mind be on Krishna. That is the blessing we want to give to people. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would give blessings to people, he would always bless them like that. Krishna Matir Vashtu. May your mind be on Krishna. It's important to know because it's our duty to give blessings. Devotees, brahmanas, this is the marriage season. So people at the time of marriage also, people, couples come, they want blessings. So we bless them also. May your minds always be on Krishna. That's a nice blessing to give to people. So this, uh, this purport, Prabhupada is quite a long purport here, text 13 to 15, talking about the importance of brahmanas, that we should have pure brahmanas and the blessings of a brahmana. He says, the blessings of qualified brahmanas can bring happiness not only to Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but to everyone. <laughs> Could you imagine giving blessings to Krishna? <laughs> we think Krishna should bless me. But here, in this situation, the brahmanas have come and they're giving the blessings to Krishna. Nanda Maharaj thought that Krishna required the blessings of the brahmanas. He wants that his child will be prosperous, that his life should be... And he knows the blessings of the brahmanas will greatly benefit the child. So it's important to uh, get the blessings of brahmanas and sometimes we are asked, we have to give blessings. If people ask us, yes, yes, may your mind be on Krishna, right? So the qualification Prabhupada discusses, the symptoms of a brahmana, he quotes Bhagavad Asrama Bhagavatam, seventh canto, Narada Muni, the symptoms of a brahmana are stated in Shastra. One must be qualified with these symptoms. And then Prabhupada goes on to discuss the different qualifications. He talks about danta, one who is non-envious, who does not disturb and is not puffed up with false prestige. So brahmana should be they should be Vidya Vinaya, described in Bhagavad Gita, Vidya Vinaya, learned and gentle. They shouldn't be harsh, they shouldn't be uh, aggressive, they should be gentle, without false prestige. That's important for the Brahmanas. And then Prabhupada, in the purport, he says, Therefore, in the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, those who are twice initiated so as to become brahmanas must bear in mind their great responsibility to be truthful, control the mind and senses, be tolerant, and so on. This is the duty of devotees, twice initiated devotees especially, that we have to show people the example. Sense control, control of the mind and sense, and be tolerant. I was with one, I was with a group of devotees one time and we were doing Harinam Sankirtan and one of the devotees who was in the, in the Sankirtan party, he suddenly, he, he went wild and he started attacking a group of people who were watching us. And so I, 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 I managed to get him back and said, what are you doing? And he said, I could not tolerate. <laughs> I said, you could not tolerate? What, what do you mean you could not tolerate? He said, they're, they're, they were looking at us, they were laughing at us, 
They were talking bad about us. I said, you could not tolerate that. I said, my goodness. I said, well, this is not very good. If you can't tolerate these things, you shouldn't come out here on Sankirtan. You go out there, if we go out for preaching, we have to expect sometimes we'll get the, these kind of problems. Right? We're representatives of Srila Prabhupada. So it's very important, just like sometimes we, uh, in the times of the uh, 1960s and 1970s and especially, uh, people were doing book distribution and sometimes they would do it quite aggressively. And sometimes people would even come to see Prabhupada and they would complain that, you know, your devotee did this or did that. And Prabhupada would say to them, I am very sorry. Prabhupada would apologize to them. Prabhupada didn't do anything, but he said, yeah, they're my disciples. He said, I am very sorry. So I'm responsible for them. So very, we, how careful we have to be to properly present the Krishna consciousness movement. So Prabhupada then goes on, he said, Nanda Maharaj invited good brahmanas to come to his home, not ordinary jati brahmins, but he invited people who were real brahmins who could chant the Vedic hymns and they could uh, strictly follow the religious principles. He didn't just invite people because they were born in brahmana families. Of course, taking birth in a brahmana family, it can be an advantage. It's not a, dis not a disqualification. It's an advantage if you take advantage of it. But birth alone is not enough. We get a lot of people come to our movement. They're born in brahmana families. But they don't do the, the work of the brahmins. They should actually work like a brahmin. Not just only say, I am brahmin. If you're a brahmin, you have to work like a brahmin. The brahmin's duty means that we should worship the deities and teach others to worship the deities. And we should study Shastra and teach the Shastra. And we can give charity and we can accept charity. So it's often said, actually, uh, Kavi Karnapurna, he said, in the Kali Yuga, the Brahmanas are expert in only one of these six things. Right? They're expert in only one of these arts. What, which one do you think it is? Taking charity. Yes, right. That's it. We're very, very expert in take, taking charity. Okay. And then the rest of the purport, at the end of the purport, Prabhupada said, the most important word in these three verses is Mahagumam indicating that the brahmanas were offered very palatable food of exalted quality. So Prabhupada was very particular about the quality of our prasadam. You know, when we would di distribute prasadam, Prabhupada would always say, bring me a plate. I want to see what you're distributing. If Prabhupada was there at a program, maybe a Sunday program or maybe some hall outside and we were distributing prasadam, Prabhupada would say, let me see what prasadam you're giving. And Prabhupada would taste it and he would check the quality and he would let us know. If it was not good, he would tell us. He was very concerned that the prasadam must be very good, must be very palatable, of exalted quality. And even sometimes devotees would cook things like Prabhupada was in Los Angeles one time and the devotees had made some sweets, but they'd made the sweets with some kind of Western things, ingredients were all Western things, I think maybe some, maybe it was marzipan or chocolate or something like this, and they had made this sweet. And Prabhupada said, what is this? He said, why don't you make the sweets I've showed you? He said, I showed you how to make sweets. You should, you should make those kind of sweets. Don't just concoct and make all these things. 
So Prabhupada, he was really particular, very concerned. He wanted that, that the prasadam should be very good because Lord Krishna has to accept it. Lord Krishna is going to eat it. And of course, we're also the kitchen religion, right? We're the kitchen religion for me. I remember different sannyasis cooking, make samosa, make bada, uh, bara, uh, daiwada, dai like that. And Prabhupada would, when they brought it, Prabhupada would say, oh, you could do a bit more of this or a bit more ghee in the dough or something like this. Uh, the filling's not quite right. I remember one devotee, one sannyasi, he was cooking samosas for Prabhupada and Prabhupada would tell him all the things what he needed to do to improve the quality of the samosas. <laughs> so Prabhupada was training everyone because Prabhupada himself was an expert cook and he wanted, it, it's, it's an art, it's a Vaishnava art and we should be able to cook nice things. And so Prabhupada says, still today in India, from these two things, two things, namely food grains and milk, hundreds and thousands of varieties of food are prepared and then they are offered to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So very important for us and then Prabhupada goes on talking about the different tastes which are there, sweet, salty, sour, pungent, and then food that can be licked, chewed, swallowed, sucked, different varieties, right? So many different varieties and tastes are there. When one is expert cook, then they can prepare these different kinds of food. So this is a, the duty of the Krishna consciousness movement, that we should prepare very attractive, very tasty, very pleasing food for people. And then Prabhupada finishes the purport by talking about how people take advantage of the cows, they want to kill the cows. Instead of using the cows to give milk or to provide good things, to produce grains and so on, they kill the cow. So Prabhupada said, uncivilized men living in the jungle and being unqualified to produce food by agriculture by agriculture and cow protection, they may, they may eat animals. But a human society advanced in knowledge must learn how to produce first-class food simply by agriculture and protection of cows. So this is the principle. Agriculture, land, very important. Prabhupada said this will be the big problem in the, in the future, in the years to come. There won't be enough food and people won't know how to grow food or how to produce food. So he was very concerned that the farms were very important, that we should have farms and we should produce our own food. He liked very much if we could produce our own grains and vegetables. Didn't like that we have to depend on others to get everything. Certainly, you eat grains grown by karmis, you get karma. So we should try to, it's very beneficial. Prabhupada said, farming is the most pious profession. Okay, going ahead, text number 16, talking about uh, Nanda Maharaj gave the brahmanas charity, he gave them cows well decorated with gold and the cows they were giving, they were not old cows and they were giving ample milk, they were not dry cows but they were giving a lot of milk. We see sometimes people they have a herd of cows, they don't get any milk, they're not getting any milk. It's not supposed to be, we, we don't take care of the cows. So the brahmanas, they were given the cows and they were happy and they gave more blessings upon the family. That's what you want. They were expert in chanting Vedic hymns and they were all yogis, fully equipped with mystic powers. 
mystic powers in every action with other members of society, brahmanas are certainly dependable. In this age, however, one must take into account that the brahmanas are uncertain in their qualification. Because there are no yajnic brahmanas, all yajnas are forbidden. The only yajna we can do in Kali Yuga, Kali Yuga Dharma Hari Nam Sankirtan. That is the real yajna for this age. All other yajnas, just a show, no real meaning. But life is meant for yajna, and yajna is done by chanting the Maha Mantra. So we are teaching people how to do this simple yajna. All right, going ahead, text 18. One year after Krishna's appearance. So we had, after three months there was Uttana ceremony and then Krishna's coming out of the house. And now one year after Krishna's appearance, Mother Yashoda was patting her son on her lap. But suddenly she felt the child to be heavier than a mountain peak and she could no longer bear the weight. It was a sudden thing. Usually she'd be, the child would be in her lap. But Lord Krishna's omniscient and he understood that this demon is coming. Which demon? Trinavarta. Trinavarta. Trinavarta, right. And he's going to come and he's, he's going to pick up Lord Krishna, right? Trinavarta. Trinavarta, then what form is he in? Whirlwind. Yeah, whirlwind. he's a whirlwind, right, in the form of a whirlwind. Now he also has an interesting history. Jalangi. Yes. What's the history in Trinavarta? Who was he? Trinavarta was before, um, like the first life, they were Gen Yaksha and Gen Kasipu, and then they become Ravana and Kumbhakarna. In the third life, they become Trinavarta and Dantavakra. But I'm not sure which one is Jaya, which one is No, Vijaya. no, no, no. That's no. not, that's not Trinavarta. Jaya and Vijaya, they became Sishupal and Dantavarka. This is I Trinavarta. Oh, sorry, Maharaj. This Trinavarta, right? Trinavarta is different. Yeah, it's mentioned in the commentary that I was reading about Trinavarta, his history, that in his previous life, he was a king and he was a devotee of Hari and he would do yagyas. But, you know, he's a king, so he enjoys, he was enjoying with women. His name was King uh, King S uh, Sila Sila Saksha. I wrote it down. King Sala Saksha. Anyway, he was he was he's a king, and he was enjoying with women in the Muni. So Darvasa Muna cursed him. He cursed him to become a demon because he did not give proper attention to Darvasa Muna is like that, you know, he's powerful and he can curse people without much reason. Everybody was very careful about Darvasa Muni. So he cursed his king. But he told them, he said, you will be delivered by, you'll get delivered by the, the grace of when Lord Krishna's body is touching you, by the touch of Lord Krishna's body, you will be delivered. When the Supreme Lord comes, He will deliver you, He will liberate you from this curse of being the demon. So. But the Garga Samhita says he was the king Sahasraksha, Sah a powerful king of Pandu Desha. 
Ah, Sahara, Sahasraksha. Thank you, Manaji. Sahasraksha. Yes. Powerful king of where? Pandu Desha. Yes. And when will he get delivered? Yeah, by the touch of Krishna's form. By the touch of Lord Krishna's form. Right. This is mentioned in the Garga Samhita. Garga Samhita actually was translated by Dhanavir Goswami. There's a, it's available. You can get it in the, probably you can get it over here in Mayapur. Dhanavir Goswami translated and published it. Garga Samhita. He did the translation himself and wrote the commentaries. He thought it's a very interesting book. So we see, anyway, it's mentioned there, as Maharaj said. So this was a history about Trinavarta. So Lord Krishna understands this demon Trinavarta is going to come. He's coming nearby. So Lord Krishna arranges to become very, very heavy. So heavy that Mother Yashoda couldn't bear the weight. So Mother Yashoda put him down. Instead of keeping him on her lap, she put him down. Why did Krishna become heavy? Yes, Maharaji, do you know? Why did Krishna become so heavy? What's his purpose? So that Mother Yashoda could put him down. Yes. Why, do, why does he want Mother Yashoda to put him down? He didn't want her to get hurt. Right, that's right. That's the point, right? He doesn't want anything to happen to Mother Yashoda because Mother Yashoda is his prima bhakta. And so he knows this demon, this Trinavarta is coming and he's going to pick up baby Krishna. He's, he's a whirlwind. So Trinavarta was thinking he'd come and kill both of them. But Lord Krishna doesn't want Mother Yashoda to go up there in the air. It's all right for Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna is just in the form of a little baby. So the demon will carry him. And this whirlwind demon, whirlwind, he, it's described dust and, uh, dust and sand, like the dust, dust and dirt. Everything gets picked up in the whirlwind. So it said, he's a, he's a representative of the mode of passion and ignorance. Uh, so, so this Trinavarta is the mode of passion and ignorance because it brings up so much dust and dirt, it's all flying everywhere and sand and everything. And it, it created such a commotion when that whirlwind came in Vrindavan, it was for about one hour this summer and they have these winds, you know, and they have that wind come in sometime in the hot season, and very dry. So all the dust was flying and this whirlwind came and it was everything, nobody could see anything. And Mother Yashoda, she'd put down baby Krishna and she couldn't see anything. She couldn't see what was happening when this whirlwind came into the Vrindavan. And that whirlwind came into Vrindavan, this Trinavarta, and look, baby Krishna is lying there. So Trinavarta, he somehow gets that baby to come into his whirlwind. Because initially Krishna had been very heavy to get Mother Yashoda to make him light, uh, to, uh, to get Mother Yashoda to put him down, he made himself very heavy. So after Mother Yashoda put him down, then the Trinavarta demon came. So that time Krishna became light because he wants Trinavarta to pick him up. He's going to go for a ride, right? Krishna's a child and children like to play. You know, one of the things children like to do, like to go round and round. You know, sometimes we pick up children and we hold their hands and then we burrow around, we go around like that. And the children enjoy, they think, oh, this is great. And they, you know, sometimes you get a little boy, you know, you take their arms and you spin around with them and they're so happy. So Krishna had that mood also. He wanted to play and he was being, he was going to play with Trinavarta in the whirlwind. And Trinavarta, Trinavarta, of course, he doesn't think he's just going to play. He's thinking he's going to kill. He wants to kill Krishna. But, Krishna Maharaj, yes. 
I also heard related to this is when he came, as you said, it was a lot of dirt and um, dust uh, all around the atmosphere that everything was not clearly visible, kind of darkness also because things were not clearly visible. So as you said, in the mode of passion and ignorance, Krishna was not seen to anyone. So when we also go in mode of passion and ignorance, we will not be able to see Krishna. We have to come in mode of goodness. <laughs> that time because of dust and darkness, it's compared to mode of passion and ignorance. So Krishna yes. was not seen. Wonderful point. Thank you very much. Yes, certainly passion and ignorance. The enemies. But Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. We can't even see in mode of goodness also, no? We have to raise to pure goodness. Yeah, we have to, we want to come up to pure goodness, yes, well, yes, that's the, the desire, but to get up to pure goodness, we should first come to goodness. Coming up, coming to goodness will help us to come to pure goodness. And the main point is to get free of the passion and ignorance. Passion and ignorance are what really bind us. Of course, we don't want to get too much attached to the mode of goodness. We do want to ultimately transcend the mode of goodness. But Prabhupada said, generally, devotee will maintain the mode of goodness. We'll try to maintain the, the, mode of, the mode of goodness. And we definitely want to avoid the modes of passion and ignorance, because that is the real darkness. And that's what creates the problems. So the modes of nature, very strong, very binding. The binding becomes even stronger as we go down, right? But as we come up to the mode of goodness, then it's a bit better. The binding is not so intense. It's better for us, right? Srimad Bhagavatam says, evam prasana manaso bhagavad bhakti yogita. Thus established in the mode of goodness, the man gains liberation from material association and comes to know scientifically the personality of Godhead. So we do want to understand these modes of nature, definitely the, the darkness and the ignorance, the dust and the dirt. That's why it's so important, keep everything neat and clean. Prabhupada was always stressing these things. When he would come to temples, he would like to go through the temple and look and see everything. He wanted to check, are the devotees keeping everything neat and tidy? Are they folding up their beds in the morning and are they washing the floors? Are they keeping everything nice and clean? Especially in the temple, very, very important. You have deity or something, you have to keep the temple very, very clean. Cleanliness is next to godliness. So a Brahminical quality, right? Brahmins, we have to keep the Brahminical standard bathing regularly, that's important. And purifying our body, putting the tilak on, don't just put tilak on the forehead, put tilak on all the different temples of the body. Regularly bathing two, three times a day and worshipping the deities. And we were hearing about Lord Krishna becoming very heavy. There are different yoga, <coughs> different yoga cities, right? Asta cities, eight yoga cities. One of them is to become very light, lighter than the lightest, and the other one is to become very heavy. What, what is the Sanskrit name? Is it Mahima and Lagima? Yeah, Lagima is uh, becoming uh, uh, lighter, Maharaj. Mahima is heavier. Right. So, Lord Krishna, first of all, used the Mahima potency, made himself very heavy. Mother Yashoda put him down. And then became Lagima, became very light. Trinavarta came, and Tr Trinavarta can pick him up and carry him up into the air. And he's a whirlwind, 
so Lord Krishna is going round. That very name, Trinavarta, it means one who makes the, everything grass go round. So everything gets caught up in the whirlwind, it just goes around and round. So this was playing, Lord Krishna was playing. And this demon Trinavarta, he could become visible and invisible. Very powerful. He had that power sometimes. But when Lord Krishna was up there in the whirlwind and he was held by Trinavarta. So Lord Krishna got him by the neck. <laughs> Lord Krishna is holding him by the neck. And then Lord Krishna, he'd been, he'd been using Mahima, he made himself very light. So Lord Krishna made himself very light so he could go up in the air. And then he became very heavy. He became very heavy and Vritasura is trying to carry him. Now Vritasura was thinking he was heavy, but he was holding Krishna, well, actually Krishna was holding him. It wasn't that <laughs> Vritasura was holding Krishna, it was Krishna holding Vritasura and he was holding him by the neck and he wouldn't let go. And Vritasura understood this Krishna is too heavy. It was like carrying a heavy, heavy mountain. It was so heavy. Vritasura, he, he was going higher and higher, but when Krishna became heavy, he had to stop. He couldn't go forward anymore. He couldn't go up anymore. He couldn't go anywhere because Krishna was so heavy. And he was trying to get Krishna off him, but Krishna wouldn't let go. Krishna was holding him tight. So, Lord Krishna was holding this demon very tightly in his, and the demon just had to come down and he came crashing down. The Vritasura was very heavy, but Lord Krishna, when he came down, he was like a leaf, like, falling, like when a leaf is falling from the tree. The leaf falls very gently on the ground. But Vritasuri is like some big rock, he's a heavy rock. He came crashing down on the ground and all of his bones were broken and he died like that. So this was the, the Leela with Vritasura. Yeah. We'll read some of the sections from Prabhupada's purport in text 18, Prabhupada writes, Krishna knew that when Vritasura came and took him away from his mother, from his mother's lap, Mother Yashoda would be greatly bereaved. So he did not want his mother to suffer any difficulty from the demon. Therefore, because he is the source of everything, Janmadhyasyayata, he assured, he assumed the heaviness of the entire universe. So that was when Mother Yashoda put him down. He became so heavy, Mother Yashoda couldn't bear to hold him. So he, Mother Yashoda put him down and then I gave Trinavarta an opportunity to take Krishna away. And Krishna is able to play with him. The child returned, after some time Krishna of course will come back. So Mother Yashoda, when she put the child down because she was feeling the weight of Krishna, she was thinking that something is wrong, that maybe he's being attacked by a ghost or a demon. So she was worried. So she took shelter of Lord Narayan because she's a very, she's Nitya Siddha devotee. So naturally anything, anything goes a little not quite right, then she takes shelter of the Supreme Lord. She's always thinking of the Supreme Lord. 
She never forgets Krishna. So whenever there is some disturbance like this, why is Krishna so heavy, something is wrong. So she prays to Lord Narayan to protect her child. And she calls for the brahmanas. She wants the brahmanas to come to do something about this heaviness. So she could not understand that this was all for Krishna's pastimes. Krishna wants to arrange this pastime with Vritasura. Mother Yashoda did not understand that Krishna is the heaviest of all heavy things and that Krishna rests within everything. Matstani Sarva Bhutani. As confirmed in Bhagavad Gita, Maya Tatamidam Sarvam Jagad Avyakta Murtina, Krishna is everywhere in his impersonal form and everything rests upon him. Nonetheless, Nachaham Teshvavastitaha, Krishna is not everywhere. Mother Yashoda was unable to understand this philosophy because she was dealing with Krishna as his real mother by the arrangement of Yoga Maya. Not understanding the importance of Krishna, she could only seek shelter of Lord Narayan for Krishna's safety and call the Brahmanas to counteract the situation. So Srila Prabhupada very nicely explains this mood here, the how Mother Yashoda's her Vatsalya Ras is pure Vatsalya Ras. There's no conception that her child is God. There's no Aishwarya Gan there. And so she can only think of Krishna as her child and how to protect him. Of course, Prabhupada is quoting Bhagavad Gita, that Krishna is everywhere, he's in everything. So when the child was put on the ground, that's when Trinavarta come. And Trinavarta, he's a servant of Kamsa. Kamsa had initially sent Putana. Putana was his, you know, his front, up front. He sent her up front, go, kill all the children. So he had sent Putana out and he thought she would do the work. But then he heard how Putana had been killed. So he was shocked because he knew Putana was very powerful. So the next one to go, Sakatasur. He sent Sakatasura in there. He was invisible. But he also got killed. And now, after that was when Krishna was three months old, Sakatasura was killed. And now we're hearing Trinavarta, one year, Krishna's one, and how he's going to be killed. So with the death of Trinavarta, then Kamsa is really worried because Putana, Sakatasur, Trinavarta, all gone. Right? And how did they go? Well, Putana went with the Krishna's lips, just by the power of Lord Krishna's lips, by the touch of his lips, he took out the life air of Putana. And Shakatasura went by the touch of Lord Krishna's lotus feet. And Trinavarta, he's going to go by the touch of Lord Krishna's body. So we see how Krishna is omnipotent, that any parts of his body, he can, he can kill these demons with any part of his body. It's so wonderful hearing these different pastimes and appreciating them. All right, so Krishna's heaviness, the purport of text 20, Krishna's heaviness was unbearable for the child's mother. But when Trinavarta came, he immediately carried the child away. This was another demonstration of Krishna's inconceivable energy. When the Trinavarta demon came, Krishna became lighter than the grass so that the demon could carry him away. This was Ananda Maya Ras, Krishna's blissful transcendental pleasure. We saw in Chaitanya Leela also that uh, at the time of the, when Haridas Thakur had been beaten in 22 marketplaces, 
then Haridas Thakur somehow was not dying. And so the people who were beating him, they prayed to Haridas that, you please leave your body, if we don't kill you, we'll be punished. So Haridas Thakur thought, oh, oh, all right, uh, and then Haridas Thakur became unconscious. And so then they thought, oh, he's dead. And they tried to pick up his body, but they couldn't pick him up because it made his body so heavy, they couldn't pick him up. So they didn't know what to do. This was Haridas Thakur. Haridas Thakur also has mystic powers, mystic potencies. Actually, the, coming up, there's another statement also, how devotees all have mystic powers, right? How did Prabhupada show his mystic power? When we asked Prabhupada, what is your mystic power, Swamiji, what did he say? By spreading Krishna conscious all over the world. Yes. And if peace has become happiness. Yes, he pointed to the, the people, he said before, he said these people were all sinful. They didn't follow any regulations. Now they're very gentle and they're very God conscious, very law, law abiding. Before they were dirty and morose and full of sinful habits, but now they're mad after love of God. So that is the mystic power of the devotee. Any other examples of Prabhupada's mystic power? Can I add one point, Guru Maharaj? Yes, yes please. Oh, one time Janani Vas Prabhu mentioned Srila Prabhupada to give a comment. He said the yogis, they enter into the Ganges water and then they came out from another place. So they can travel inside the Ganga river. And then Janani Vas Prabhu said, Prabhupada mentioned that I, I saw that. So that means Prabhupada also has the power of those yogis. <laughs> okay. We never saw Prabhupada display that power. He I, I read in, uh, may I speak on it? Yes, please. I read in uh, Prabhupada Leela Vrit. Prabhupada was, I believe, in Hyderabad. And they gave him a coconut coconut water to drink. So he drank, then to his full satisfaction, then the next devotee drank to his full satisfaction, then the next devotee drank to the full satisfaction. Actually many devotees drank and yet it was not finishing. Ah, it yeah. comes in <laughs> Okay, that was a nice thing. It's like, like I'm God, right? Lord Chaitanya with the mangoes. So Prabhupada had the coconut. I was thinking, there was one example, uh, when they were doing the installation of Radha Landaneshwara in, in London, it was 1969, 1969 I think it was, and uh, they were installing the deities and the altar actually kind of collapsed. They'd built the altar but it practically collapsed, but somehow Prabhupada was in there and Prabhupada just grabbed it and saved it. You know, although he was elderly, 70 plus, Prabhupada somehow by his mystic power, he was able to hold up the altar while the devotees could do some, make some arrangement to save the deities. And so it was an incredible feat for an elderly person that he could do that. So I thought that was an example of his mystic power. And also I thought the fact that he could travel everywhere constantly, writing and traveling, never get jet lag. Never, he was never overcome by fatigue. He was always energetic. And the, the young sannyasis, they would all be falling asleep and so tired, and, but Prabhupada would be pushing on, just fully engaged. That's also like mystic power that he could do it. Right. Yes, Prabhu? Uh, I also heard a story of Sri Brahma, like he was walking down the staircase and the only saw that he was not touching the floor. Oh, he, did, he didn't leave any footprints. Yeah. Yeah, yeah everybody, but, everybody else left footprints, but Prabhupada didn't leave any footprints. <laughs> 
something like that, is it? Also that he stepped on a worm and the worm kept on walking. Like he was not, you know, touching the floor, like the worm went under his foot. Okay. <laughs> like Maharaj Yudhisthira's chariot didn't touch the ground, huh? So Prabhupada didn't, <laughs> didn't touch the ground. Okay. So, all right. So, uh, text 21 says, covering the whole land of Gokul with particles of dust, that demon acting as a strong whirlwind covered everyone's vision and began vibrating everywhere with a greatly fearful sound. He was really a powerful demon. For a moment, the whole pasturing ground was overcast with dense darkness. From the dust storm, Mother Yashoda was unable to find her son, where she had placed him. Right? After the, the whirlwind came, Mother Yashoda doesn't know what happened. Where's my child? Where's Krishna gone? Oh, where's my baby? I put him here. He's not there. Where's he gone? Oh, Mother, so Mother Yashoda is really, really worried. And when she sees Krishna is not there, she just breaks down crying. And she fell down on the ground like a cow who had lost her calf, be began to lament very pitifully. She was really feeling the separation, the pain of separation from her child. So that whirlwind had taken away her child and what's Mother Yashoda going to do? There's no trace. She could not understand what had happened. And when Mother Yashoda was crying, then all the other gopis were wondering, what's going on? And then Mother Yashoda tells them about the Krishna's disappeared, the baby's gone. And they all cry, they all start to cry because the gopis, they also love Krishna. The dearest person to them is also Krishna. And so they felt very sorry and they were also crying with Mother Yashoda. So text 20, 25, when the force of the dust storm and the wind subdued, Yashoda's friends, the other gopis, approached Mother Yashoda, hearing her pitiful crying. Not seeing Krishna present, they too felt very much aggrieved and joined Mother Yashoda crying, their eyes full of tears. So this attachment for the gopis, attachment of the gopis to Krishna, this is their pure love. It is not material, it is transcendental. This is due to their prema bhakti, that Lord Krishna is a dear most lovable object. And these people of Vrindavan, they all love Krishna more than anything. So, Mother Yashoda is lamenting, the ladies are also lamenting. And Lord Krishna, he's playing. He's up there in the air, playing around, whirling around, holding on to the demon Trinavarta. Took, it took the demon Trinavarta, took Krishna very high in the sky, but Krishna became heavier than the demon. The demon had to stop his force and could go no further. Right? Lord Krishna exhibited this Mahima Siddhi, becoming very heavy. Different yoga cities are there. Right? Prapti Siddhi. Prapti City can bring something from far away. Prabhupada tells, that he met a man who asked him, what fruit do you like? And Prabhupada said, oh, I like pomegranates. So the man said, oh, they have very nice pomegranates in Kabul. So the man in, sat in meditation, he held out his hand, and a few moments later, a big pomegranate came in his hand. And the man said, this is from Kabul. So the man had this kind of practice city. And of course, we just heard about the people bathing in the Ganga, that they could go in there one place and come up another place many miles away. So that, that's another yoga city. So there are eight yoga cities. 
It's a, by practicing mystic yoga, you can get some of these yoga perfections. And people, there are many people who very much want to get these kind of yoga cities, but they don't know how to use them properly. And at this, in the, if you look at the second par paragraph there, in the purport of this text number 25, 26, Prabhupada writes, devotees automatically have all mystic powers, but they do not like to compete with Krishna. <laughs> devotees have mystic powers. Yeah, we, we must have some kind of mystic power just to stay alive in Krishna consciousness. We have to have some kind of mystic power <laughs> to keep going in Krishna consciousness and just, we see devotees, they do everything. Devotees travel so many places. Prabhupada pointed out when Prabhupada's time, you know, the Los Angeles temple, so many devotees, so many motor cars, and nobody working. Where's a, and they're, they're living in nice places, they have nice property, and nobody's working. How do they manage? By the grace of Krishna. And we see it all around the world. Devotees, they can make nice temples for Lord Krishna, and they can live very comfortably in Krishna consciousness. You can be married, you can have a family, you can maintain yourself nicely. You, may, you, won't, you won't be rich, but at the same time your basic needs will be provided and will be happy. So that is Krishna consciousness, living peacefully and happily. We're not interested in a lot of sense gratification, we just want to serve Krishna. We want devotional service. So the devotees have mystic powers, but we don't use them to compete with Krishna. We may use them to serve Krishna, but we won't use them to compete. Prabhupada said, instead they fully surrender to Krishna, and their yoga power is demonstrated by Krishna's mercy. Right? Krishna's mercy. Do you get Krishna's mercy, Madhiji, Rasa Samaya? Yes, yes, Maharaj. How, in what form do you get Krishna's mercy? In all, in every way, Maharaj, like say, uh, during this pandemic, you could see that the whole world was suffering. But uh, the devotees, we got together, we had more programs online, we were uh, giving more Krishna consciousness, we were uh, uh, preaching to more people and we did not feel so much anxious uh, because of the pandemic. So that we could see that as a special mercy of Krishna. Yes, right. Very nice, yes. Thank you. Yeah, really, for the devotees, you know, what was really a terrible time for the materialistic people was a wonderful time for the devotees, isn't it? It's a wonderful opportunity. We get more, more Krishna consciousness. We have more programs, more hearing and chanting. Wonderful programs going on. So we're so fortunate. So this is, that's also Krishna's mystic power that he arranges these things for us so that we can, if we take the opportunity, every opportunity, we can always increase our service to Krishna. So Prabhupada talks about some people, they get some little yoga cities and they want to attract followers and they claim their avatar of God. And Prabhupada said here, at the present moment there are many so-called Babas who present themselves as incarnations of God by showing some insignificant mystic wonder. And foolish people regard them as God because of lacking knowledge of Krishna. So that is the point. You know, de devotees should not be fooled. Of course, devotees are not fooled. The people who are fooled are the people who are, they don't know, they have no knowledge of Krishna. 
so they're easily fooled. So we have to try to educate people about these things. So this is a wonderful pastime, how Lord Krishna is actually delivering this uh, Trinavarta. So because of Krishna's weight, text 27, Trinavarta considered him to be like a great mountain or a hunk of iron. But because Krishna had caught the demon's neck, the demon was unable to throw him off. He therefore thought of the child as wonderful, since he could neither bear the child nor cast aside the burden. So just like Putana, we saw Putana also, she was calling out, Oh child, leave me, leave me! <laughs> You know, they were so fortunate, they were getting the touch of Lord Krishna and that's going to give them the greatest mercy. But they were not appreciating it in their demonic body. But Krishna is so kind, he didn't let go. He held on until they left the body. Prabhupada's purport of 27, Now, since Trinavarta was falling because of Krishna's heaviness, he wanted to save himself by throwing Krishna off from his neck, but he was unable to do so because Krishna held him very tightly. Consequently, this would be the last time for Trinavarta's yoga power. Now he was going to die by the arrangement of Krishna. <laughs> so, Actually, Krishna was enjoying the ride with Trinavarta, going up there in the sky, just like, you know, children like to be thrown up into the air, throw them up in the air and catch them, they'll laugh. So Krishna, was, he was, this was his childhood Leela. He was enjoying Trinavarta, carrying him around, and burrowing him around in the whirlwind. But now, this demon is choked and he crashes to the ground. He fell down with the lip, and Krishna's on top of him. The demon crashes to the ground and all his bones are broken. They land on some hard stone. And the, and the gopis, they were wondering where Krishna had gone. And then they suddenly, when they're crying for Krishna, they see this demon fall from the sky onto the big slab of stone. And it said his limbs dislocated as if he had been pierced by the arrows of Lord Shiva, like Tripurasura. Right? Who's going to tell us about Tripurasura? You've studied that, right? That was in seventh canto Bhagavatam. Tripura, Tripurasura, the demon Tripura. Who knows the pastime? Seventh Canto Bhagavatam. Mas, can I speak? Yes, please, Prabhu. There were three cities, Tripura, and the demons were attacking from them on the demigods. And Lord Shiva went to fight on the behalf of the uh, demigods, but he was not able to win. So that time he was given the bow and the weapons by Lord Vishnu, and then he burned all the three cities in. Uh, into SS. That's why he's called Tripura Devi. Yes, but there was a bit before that, right? There was a bit before that that uh, these three cities, these three fortresses, one was made of gold, one was made of silver, one was of st and steel. And they got attacked. Lord Shiva killed them all. But these three fortresses were made by Maya Dhanava. Maya Dhanava is another demon, and uh, he had given them these fortresses. So when they all got killed, what you know what Maya Dhanava did? Do you remember? He brought the life. Yeah, how did he do it? He made a lake made of nectar. Right. He had a well with nectar. And then he entered them and he them. Right. And they came back to life. So, then what happens? Then, uh, uh, 
Lord Vishnu and Brahma comes as a calf and a cow and they drink the whole nectar. Yeah, they drink all the nectar. And then? And then Lord Shiva was empowered to like kill them so that they can't... Yeah. Uh, then come. Lord Krishna came and he gave Lord Shiva a lot of weapons, a lot of astras and everything. <laughs> yeah. So Lord Shiva came. Lord Shiva came and killed them all again. And this time there's no nectar to save them. And Mayadhanava, although he's a demon, he also knows philosophy and he understood, well, this is destiny. <laughs> he said, you can't change destiny. <laughs> so, that was Tripasura. So it's mentioned here that this demon, uh, Trinavarta, his limbs were dislocated just like he'd been pierced by the arrow of Lord Shiva when he destroyed Tripura Sur. Mm. Prabhupada writes in the purport, he said, actually such devotees are always in transcendental bliss and such apparent calamities provide a further impetus for that bliss. Calamities, apparent calamities provide an opportunity for us to experience bliss. Do you have any experience like that, anybody? What seemed like a calamity becomes bliss for us? Well, we just described, right, the pandemic. We thought it was a calamity. It's a, it's a pandemic. It's a calamity all over the world. But the devotees are not thinking pandemic. The devotees are thinking bliss, right? It's an impetus for bliss. Totally different because we're transcendental, because we have we're engaged in Krishna's service. Any other examples? Calamities which become blissful? No? <laughs> <laughs> Problem with the mic there, Prabhu. You got a problem with your mic? Maharaj Srinivas Gopal Prabhu is saying that in Mayapur, when there is a flood, like a calamity, but our devotees are very blissful worshipping the Lord. Really? When there's a flood in Mayapur, it's blissful, is it? Oh, not all people. In, in Mayapur, the flood is uh, blissful. Devotees and uh, Yeah? What did you say? What's he say? Okay. Yes, Maharaj. Devotees enjoy. Devotees always enjoy. They have nothing else to do but enjoy, right? <laughs> Prabhupada said chanting, dancing, feasting. This is a movement of recreation only. Just simple recreation. Maharaj, when. Uh, Japanese were bombing Kolkata. Prabhupada was uh, enjoying frying kachoris for Radha Krishna. <laughs> he was not afraid. Right. <laughs> so his name is Kachori Baba. Huh? Yes, very nice. Okay, going ahead, text 30. So the gopis immediately picked up Krishna from the chest of the demon and delivered him free from all inauspiciousness to Mother Yashoda. Because the child, although taken into the sky by the demon, was unhurt, and now free from all danger and misfortune, the gopis and cowherd men headed by Nanda Maharaj were extremely happy. Yeah, you can see the people of Vrindavan, they're also happy. Big demons are coming, calamities are coming, but it's more bliss. Putana came, that was bliss, they burned Putana and the Aguru sent 
filled the air. The whole place became very fragrant. Sakatasura was removed and, and now we have Trinavarta. He's also killed by the mercy of Krishna. Of course, they're liberated. They're going back to Godhead. They're, they're all special souls taking part in Krishna's pastimes. So this is Ananda Maya, Ananda Chinmaya Rasa Vigraha. In any condition, Krishna is such an Ananda Vigraha. He has no unhappiness. Do we see Krishna unhappy? Well, actually you may see sometimes it appears Krishna is unhappy. Can you think of some cases, some leelas where Krishna became unhappy? Damodar leela. He's <laughs> crying, yeah, Mother <laughs> Yashoda, okay, yes, very good, yeah. He, he became angry when Arjuna was about to be killed by Bhishma. Okay, yes, he came running, he broke his promise, picked up the chariot wheel, come running. Mm -hmm. And there's also other leelas. Uh, Maharaj? Um, yes? Krishna is uh, remembering the residents of the Vrindavan while being in Dwarka. Uh, so it seems to me that he is very unhappy. Ah. And when he was in Dwarka, sometimes Dwarka was attacked. Like, uh, was it Pondraka came? And. Or who was it? Was flying the aeroplane? He could fly, become visible and invisible. Uh, Salva. Ah, uh, Salva. Salva. Yes. yes right. so, so, at one point, Salva produced the head of Vasudev. He said, "I'm going to kill him," and he, then in front and by using he was using yoga powers. It wasn't actually Vasudev. It was a Maya Vasudev. He created a Vasudev by his yoga powers. And. Krishna was watching and he saw the salva cut off the head of Vasudev. So Krishna was like, wow. But Krishna, of course, knew it wasn't real. But Krishna was just acting. He was just playing the role to bewilder salva. And so there are incidents like that. And when he saw also the cowherd boys walk into the mouth of Aga, he thought, oh no, these coward boys have gone into Aga's mouth. Oh no, I have to go in there and get them. I have to go and save them. He saw Aga as such a huge demon. So this uh, is... Yes? Raj, also when uh, Duryodhana killed... No, Bhima killed Duryodhana, uh, Krishna was unhappy to see Duryodhana in that plight. His, his thigh was broken and vultures were about to bite him. Oh. Krishna was unhappy there. Oh, really? Oh. It's described like that, is it? In Mahabharata? Oh. Okay, interesting. Thank you. So, going ahead, text 31. It is most astonishing that although this innocent child was taken away by the Rakshasa to be eaten, he has returned without having been killed or even injured because the demon was envious, cruel and sinful. He had been killed for his own sinful activities. This is the law of nature. An innocent devotee is always protected by the Supreme Personality of Godhead and a sinful person is always vanquished for his sinful life. So very important for us to remember that. Of course, sometimes we may be bewildered. We may think, oh, devotee, innocent devotee is suffering. We have to understand also there's the plan of Lord Krishna. Ultimately, everything depends on the plan of Krishna. So devotees surrender to Krishna. So Nanda Maharaj and the gopis and other cowherd men could not understand that Krishna was the Supreme Personality of Godhead playing as a human child and that his life was not in danger under any circumstances. Rather, because of their intense parental love for Krishna, 
They thought that Krishna was an innocent child and had been saved by the Supreme Lord. So this is the pure love, Nanda and Yashoda. They have this prema bhakti. Their mood is just prema bhakti. It's not, there's no tinge of anything else. They just understand Krishna to be their child and they just want to protect him. So they're fully in this mood of Vatsalya Ras. So we see this Vatsalya Ras perfected here in Vrindavan. And of course later on Krishna will go to Dwarka. Vatsalya Ras will also be there but not quite like in Vrindavan. Then it's mentioned about fear, that fear is one of the aspects of material life. Eating, sleeping, mating and fearing, Srila Prabhupada would say. Sometimes we would say defending. Defending is also like fearing. We defend because we're afraid. So we live in this world and we're always fearful of things, right? We're fearful of different, we're fearful of this COVID disease. We're fearful of our old age, we're fearful of our death, we're fearful of losing our, our money, we're fearful of things going wrong. So many fears we have. That's the nature of material life. Uh, we, have, we have to learn to also ultimately surrender to Krishna and know that Krishna will protect us. Devotees like Nanda and Yashoda are not fearful. They're fully surrendered to Krishna. So they know about Krishna. They're not thinking, of course, Krishna will protect them. Their only fear is for Krishna, to protect Krishna. They're not worried about their own self. They have no thought of their own protection. They're th simply thinking of their child. You know, sometimes there'll be a fire and the family may be in the fire. So the mother who loves her child so much, she'll go into the fire to try to save her child. She'll give up her own life to try to rescue her child because of her deep love for her child. That is the pure, that is like Vatsalya Ras. They have that deep love for their children, that they'll go into the fire just to bring their child out. Prabhupada writes in the purport there, that Krishna will protect his devotee is a fact. And Nanda Maharaj and the other inhabitants of Vrindavan accepted this very simply, although they did not know that the Supreme Lord himself was present before them. Of course, you've already done the next chapter, which is about the, I think it's the name-giving ceremony of Lord Krishna. And at the time of the name-giving ceremony, then at that time Garga Acharya, he tells Nanda Maharaj that, that there will be many dangers, but by the grace of this child, Krishna, you'll overcome all dangers, because this child is like Lord Narayan. So, you know, you've already studied that, so you, you know that from the, the future. So Prabhupada said, our only business is to become Krishna conscious. That's an important point. And we have to engage in Krishna's service. And then we do our service for Krishna, Krishna will serve us. Krishna likes to reciprocate with his devotees. The more we serve Krishna, the more Krishna serves his devotees. So then Nanda Maharaj is feeling very fortunate because his child has been saved from so many calamities. Aga, Sakatasura, the cart falling over, and now this Trinavarta whirlwind have all tried to create big disturbance in Goku, but Krishna's unharmed. So Nanda Maharaj is thinking more and more about the words of Vasudev and how Vasudev was such a great man that he could understand the situation and he'd warned Nanda Maharaj to go back and take care of things there. So Vas Nanda Maharaj is really appreciating these words of Vasudev that oh he was so learned, he was so right. And now text 32, Nanda Maharaj is analyzing why it is that this child Krishna 
And why is it their whole family have been saved from death despite all these calamities? And he talks about the different austerities which they may have done and pious activities which they may have performed. And because of these things, it's brought happiness to the family and to the child also, because of the different pious activities which they have done. Of course, you do good, you get good, right? We say, as you sow, so shall you reap. Or in India, jaisa kariga, aisa bariga. You get the results of your work. Prabhupada said, thus one becomes pious, and as a result, one is happy, even in material conditions of life. So it's very good for us also as devotees to be pious. And our piety, of course, we said, the best thing we have to give people is Krishna consciousness. And we do want whatever we have, we, want, we like to share it with people. When people come to our temple, we invite them, come, take prasada. And some people even come and stay in the temple. Sometimes life members come, they have rooms for life members that they can come and stay and give people a chance to be with the devotees. So like that, we, we want to be pious, cultivate that piety. We don't become Krishna conscious just by, by, by being pious, but it's an important aspect that as devotees, we should have all good qualities. And one of the good qualities is to be pious. Okay, text 33. Having seen all these incidents in Vrindavan, Nanda Maharaj became more and more astonished and he remembered the words spoken to him by Vasudev in Mathura. So we have one more pastime here. One day Mother Yashoda, having taken up Krishna, placed him on her lap, was feeding him milk from her breast with material affection. The milk was flowing from her breast and the child was drinking it. Right? The milk was, Mother Yashoda had so much love, her clothes were regularly soaked with the, her milk because she loved Krishna so much, her milk was flowing. So when Krishna was finished drinking his mother's milk and Mother Yashoda was touching him and looking at his brilliant smiling face, the baby yawned and Mother Yashoda saw in his mouth the whole sky the higher planetary system and the earth, the luminaries in all directions, the sun, moon, fire, air, the seas, islands, mountains, rivers, forests, and all kinds of living entities, moving and non-moving. So this is the first incident of Krishna showing the universe within his mouth to Mother Yashoda. There'll be another one, of course, when Krishna is eating dirt, that's also another one. Different. Krishna will show these things to Mother Yashoda. Why is Krishna doing, doing like that? Prabhupada touches on it in the purport. He says, by the arrangement of Yoga Maya, Krishna's pastimes with Mother Yashoda were all reg regarded as ordinary. So here was an opportunity for Krishna to show his mother that the whole universe is situated within him. So Mother Yashoda sees the universe which is in, with, appears to be in his mouth. So Krishna has been performing these pastimes, but these pastimes are like human activities, like little child. They don't understand there's any divine power. But when Krishna shows the universe within his mouth, then that's a big shock to Mother Yashoda. And she closes her eyes. Now why does she close her eyes when she sees the universe in the mouth of Krishna? Why would she do that? Krishna Kanaya Prabhu. Any ideas? Why does Mother Yashoda close her eyes?
Did you hear the question, Prabhu? Uh, yes, Prabhu. Yes, Maharaj, I have the question. A little, and? little puzzled with this question. Okay. Uh, anybody else would like to answer this question? Why would Mother Yashoda, who loves Krishna so much and she always wants to see Krishna, she doesn't like to lose sight of Krishna, but when she looked in his mouth and saw the whole universe, she closed her eyes. You know that we... Only because it was not attractive for her, because of her mother's feelings. Yes, right. That's one reason. She did not appreciate it, right? It, it wasn't attractive to her. Yes. Yes, Maharaj you wanted to say something also? Yeah, the same thing, Maharaj. The relationship between Mother Yashoda and Krishna is of uh, pure um, ma uh, maternal love. So, um, she did not want it, the opulence to come in between, so she closed her eyes. Right, yes. Yeah, she, she was, she was uh, worried that maybe some other danger. So, her, her eyes became restless. And Prabhupada said the, her eyes became like those of a deer cub. So this was all the arrangement of yoga maya. We see when Arjuna saw the universal form, he didn't like to see it either. He told Krishna, let me see your forearm form, let me see your original form. So in this way, uh, Krishna revealed his four, forearm form to Arjuna and then the two-arm form. So Krishna is playing these games with Mother Yashoda. He was uh, letting her see the whole universe in her mouth. And the text, says, text 37 says, When Mother Yashoda saw the whole universe within the mouth of her child, her heart began to throb. And in astonishment, she wanted to close her restless eyes. <laughs> okay. So at the end of this chapter here, we see there's some uh, two extra verses appear. In this way, to chastise and kill the demons, the child Krishna demonstrated many activities in the house of Nanda Maharaj, and the inhabitants of Braja enjoyed these incidents. To increase the transcendental pleasure of the gopis and the gopas, Krishna, the killer of all demons, was thus raised by his father and mother, Nanda and Yashoda. Then Sri Vijayawada Tirtha also has another verse after the, after the third verse in this chapter. Parikshit Maharaj then requested Sukadeva Goswami to continue speaking such narrations about the pastimes of Krishna so that the king could enjoy from them transcendental bliss. Okay, so that's the end of the chapter. Are there any questions? Any points we can discuss? You want to go over? This is the last class from me this week. Of course, it's the end of the week. You're off tomorrow. Is there anything? All right. Yes, Prabhu? Yeah, these two extra verses uh, means I do not remember right here. It's not in our book, not in our PPT publication. Oh, really? Uh, at the end of the beginning of the chapter, two extra verses, two things appear. You don't have these extra verses? No, these verses are not there, no, right? Well, I'm, I'm using... They are, they are there in the purport, to the last verse. Yeah. But you don't have it in your book? Maybe you have it. 
Or maybe you have an old edition. Hare Krishna, Dhanavas Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Prabhu Dhanavas. I take this opportunity, first of all, to thank you for giving such a wonderful narration of uh, these uh, chapters. Especially, childhood pastimes of Krishna is so dear to the hearts of the devotees, all alike. In uh, whatever state of uh, activities one may be, Krishna attracts, especially the childhood pastimes. And uh, you were such wonderful narrations. You took us through the entire Leela, the pastimes, the chapters, the purports, and also keeping us fully alert and awake by asking us several questions and trying to uh, see how affectionate we are to Krishna. And that was a real test. So it was uh, very, very interesting. I personally uh, felt so blissful in these uh, sessions. And I thank you from the core of my heart and wish to definitely hear more from you in the future chapters and uh, um, also relish these wonderful pastimes. Uh, in fact, uh, I was really wondering why there is only 40 chapters related to Krishna's childhood pastime. It should be 140 chapters <laughs> because it should be a never-ending activity. Even though the other chapters are interesting, Mathura and Dwaraka pastimes as well, but the real attraction is in the childhood pastimes, which is so dear to the heart. Thank you, Maharaj, for giving us this wonderful nectar. We are completely uh, <clears throat> mesmerized by the way of your narrations. Uh, because you are intertwining the reading, the purport, the translation, as well as narrating the story, because you are personally enjoying it as well. That's how I could see from the way how your expressions were. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Thank you for your kind words. Yes, uh, I was just going to say that the Acharyas mentioned why there's not more chapters. They said they didn't have time because Maharaj Pariksha's got seven days to live, you see. So Sukadeva Goswami was aware of that. <laughs> so he had to keep it brief. Otherwise, they could have given many more. So thank you very much, Ramakrishna Prabhu. And I, I am coming back in about three weeks, I think. I'm speaking on the Venu Gita, that section. And description. And Maharaj, uh, uh, Radhika Nagarpur himself could not be present to thank you, but he has requested me to thank you on behalf of Mayapur Institute. You have taken trouble to speak for two and a half hours. It's not easy at your advanced stage. And uh, <laughs> as Ramakrishna Prabhu said, I would echo that uh, we were all felt so jubilant and absorbed in the narrations you so sweetly presented to us. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. Okay, so have a nice uh, fa break your fast this evening and have some nice pasada and have a nice next week study. Nice. Continue this study. Very pleasing to Prabhupada for all of us to do this. So I'll be seeing you in a few weeks. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Jai. Go back to Jai. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. His holiness, Bhakti Vignu Vinash. Hare Krishna. 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 Thank you very much. You still have the program today? Uh, no, it's, it's over. And it's from five something like that. Because the, there's a Purnima today, so everybody like fasting. Uh, yes, so, uh, so the devotees who came there, they were not fasting. They didn't fast? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Prabhu. Very kind of you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Which place are you from? Uh,
And there's another there's another Chen boy. He's in Taiwan. He married a Taiwan girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Antabi. Huh? Antabi. Antabi. Is that his name? I don't know his name. Um, maybe guy Taiwan. Maybe. Also, he's a friend of Raja Ram's. They used to be together. Uh huh. Yeah, you mean? Oh, what's his name? I don't remember. No, Antabi. Some other name. Yeah, I can't remember. I think still there. <laughs> Interesting. Nice. Nice to read it. Okay, Prabhu, thank you. Thank What's you. your good name? Hamsa Avatar. Hamsa Avatar. Hamsa Avatar. Thank you. Hare Krishna. <laughs>